Welcome to another interesting episode of Open Book On Location. I'm Katie Poole, the board chair of the Literary Alliance and a passionate reader like you. Now in our 12th year, our all-volunteer nonprofit provides these fabulous conversations with your favorite authors. At our website, PasadenaLiteraryAlliance.org, you can find more author interviews, make donations to the Alliance to allow us to provide grants for literary initiatives, and participate, send questions for the authors, or contribute author suggestions at the Contact Us tab. See you soon at Open Book On Location. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very excited to be talking today with two good friends and incredible writers, Cornelia Funke and Pat Rothfuss. Uh, this is not Pat, as you can see. This is Cornelia. <laughs> and uh, um, I thought we'd start first. So you and I met, uh, it seems like about 50 years ago at a Los Angeles so. at a festival of books. <laughs> Um, you were, I'm not sure why you were sitting at the mystery writers table. You were at the mysterious bookshop table, I think. And uh, I we don't got even to remember less. Why was I there? <laughs> I have no idea. You were signing books. And I was like, hi, I'm Les Klinger. And, you know, one thing led to another. And yes. Louis, this was the start of a beautiful friendship. So um, yes. you've been doing this for a while, this being writing. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about how you got started. What, 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 why did you want to be a writer? Assuming you did want to be a writer. No, I never wanted to be a writer, Les. I, that's, you know, I never wanted to be a writer. When I was 11, I wanted to be an astronaut. And then the next thing was that I was a social worker and an illustrator. And I realized, oh, I really like to tell stories, but I did it as an illustrator. The sad thing was I didn't like the stories I was supposed to illustrate. So one night, and I was already at the very advanced age of 27, I said, I'm done. I hate these stories. I'm going to write my own stories so I can illustrate them. Still not realizing that this is another profession I may like. Huh. Well, for those who haven't seen um, some, of, some of your books, not all the books, but some of the books have your wonderful illustrations in it. It was, it was a great loss to the world that you don't illustrate all the time, but you still do enough of it that we get to see it. Were you, were you illustrating fantasy books in the beginning? Or? Well, I hope for that. But at that time in Germany, there was a very strange climate because, you know, we, Germany has a very strange tradition with fantasy. There was A.T.R. Hoffman and the fairy tales and the Grimm's brothers. Sure. And sure. then the fascists came. And the fascists used all the tales, the myths, the fairy tales for their own ideology. So a long time after that, it felt like a filthy and terrible thing to even touch all our myths and our fantasy. It was associated with irrationality, with, with, with right-wing politics. Mm. And the first fantasy author was Michael Ende, who wrote The Never-Ending Story. Uh, and Oh my God, he had a tough time. So when I started as an illustrator, there was no fantasy. There was almost social realism, as they call it, which I don't think is very realistic. But nevertheless, I think fantasy is far more realistic. Uh, but uh, it was unusual. And I started in a way a tradition I knew from the English and American uh, literature. So you set out, you, you knew you wanted to write fantasy. That was for me without doubt. I wanted to draw also dragons and mermaids and I'm not a child on a schoolyard for the hundredth time. So in a way, I wanted to, you know, I had read The Hobbit. I had read all the fantasy. The, I had read Narnia. I had found it on a dusty shelf in the library and no German kid ever touched them. The only one I knew about those books was my English teacher. So I was in love with fantasy since I can think. 
you know, but that was not the atmosphere I grew up with. Did you think of yourself as writing for an audience of children? It was interesting, I think, as an illustrator at that time, as you know, it still is the truth. Most books are not right. illustrated nowadays. As you right. know, Sherlock Holmes, there was a far more advanced tradition in the 19th century. Absolutely. A picture, I mean, a George Nunes, who started the Strand Magazine, he wanted to copy the American tradition of a picture on every page. Yeah, and I still secretly wish that someday this will come back because we are such a visual culture I think it should come back and with the graphic novel and all that of course there is far more power in illustration again but when you want to be an illustrator at my time and I'm now 62 so yes it's a, it's a long time ago only illustrators were children's book illustrators and as I love the company of children anyway there was the decision but then as I won't say as your writing evolved, but over the years, you've now taken up, I mean, the last series. Well, first, I don't even need to go that far back. Inkart. Inkart is not for children only. Um, you know, none of your books are for children only, I think. But, but certainly, the later books are probably not for children. No, I, you know, I by now really like to call myself a storyteller. I don't call myself a writer or an author. I call myself a storyteller. And I always say, when you sit down by a fire, you don't say, okay, the five to 10 year olds can stay now and all the others go away. <laughs> you know? so I think we all try in our way, I think you come from the same tradition to entertain with our stories and talk the truth about the world and life and the weirdness of human existence. Yes, sometimes we do that in a more elaborate way that may appeal more to the older readers. Sometimes we do it in a way that appeals to the young ones. I write a picture book, of course, differently from Reckless. And also my audience has got older. My own children got older. Well, that's, yes, that may be exactly what happened is that people who were reading your books as young, as young people, as, you know, teenagers kept going. Yes, and they're now, where is our, where are our books, Cornelia? So I think it was a very natural progress. And, and of course, a very interesting thing was when I was asked by Guillermo de Toro to, to, put, to make a novel out of uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Because what is that? Is Pan's Labyrinth a movie for children? No, it is not. But at the Probably same time, it has a child as a hero. So it's a very beautiful example of how you can work with fantasy to show the reality of the world. You know? yes. But some stories are very dark. And I said, for example, to readers about the found, don't go there before you're 14. You don't want to be haunted by those images and scenes, right. you know, because you will not forget them. And they will be unforgettable and meaningful, but you shouldn't maybe have them in your hearts before you're 14. You know? it's, it's interesting that, that um, you know, some people talk about, I, I mentioned, uh, privately, our friend Neil Gaiman, and thinking about his book, Coraline, uh, and how many parents thought it was too scary. Uh, and Neil always said, you know, ask the 10-year-olds who are reading it and see how they feel about it. And of course, they all thought it was great. Of course, it had these strange things. But I, I think there's some truth to what you say. Some things are so disturbing. I mean, for example, I don't want to give anything away, but in the Mirror World series, for example, these creatures whose skin is of stone, yes. um, I, I find that really haunting, uh, that whole image. And, 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 and I think, you know, I absolutely see Neil's point and I agree with him. But for example, um, in the found even more in, than with everything I have come up with, that there are two scenes in there, the murder scene of a father and his son and a torture scene, an elaborate torture scene in the barn that is so, shows violence the way it is. Something crippled and terrible. Yes. To, to face violence that way, I remember I started working for Amnesty International with 14 and when I read the first torture report, what that did to me. These realities, uh, re, you know, they resonate so strongly with us that I just recommend to my readers, face that when you're about 14. I think kids are often very tough because they don't have the emotional uh, memories that we do have, of course. You can give them many dark scenes and they will not be scared at all because for them, there is no resonance, right? There are no memories that come up of loss and pain and death. They don't come yet. 
it's very interesting when you work with kids who have seen all that. That's, that's right? really interesting. They, yes. Enough. Well, and this is a perfect segue because to talk about what you're doing in the, in the real world, um, <laughs> which is I, I know that you have been deeply involved in working with children and art at this yes. point. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? And then yes, I, I want to go back to some of the questions, but. Yes, I, I just finished a picture book and uh, as an illustrator, first time I worked with oil to really give the illustrations a lot of weight and meaning, uh, I was asked to write a short story in Germany for a children's hospice. An anthology my publishers wanted to do and they said, oh, just write something entertaining. And I said, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I'm dealing with children who look at death. I cannot pretend that's not happening and entertain them. I will entertain them, but I will talk about death. So I wrote a story, it's called The Bridge. And it's about an angel who wants to bring the children over, the dying children, so that they pass the bridge of death. And they all tell him he's too young. He's only 2000 years old. So I tell the story of why this angel is not able yet to do that and that Everybody who comes and confronts death brings lots of dark things from the human existence. So I wrote it like a fairy tale, but I talked about death and the reaction was so extraordinary from the hospices that they all said, oh, it got brighter here when we read it. So I think it also teaches us as storytellers, we should not shy away from addressing that even for younger children, when they have to face it, we have to talk about it. You've been trying to reach out to, to involve children in art. I, I know that this is a project of yours. Yes. So, tell, tell us a little bit about the project. Yes, I'm, I'm at the moment doing, I, I, I live on, on an uh, old avocado farm in Malibu, not so far away from this. And uh, I, when I bought this property, I thought, well, that's far too big for me. What am I doing with this? Now I can finally do what I always wanted, bring city children here, introduce them to the strange feeling to be in the wild what it does with you, uh, but also make them paint and draw and see things. I've had a Muslim illuminator here because I invite young artists between like 21 and 36 to come here and create. I invite them, they feed themselves, they have little guest houses on my property. And I had an extraordinary experience with Aisha Hamyad, who is a Muslim illuminator, traditionally trained in Istanbul, who taught these downtown kids how to make color from uh, pomegranates and avocado and how to illuminate. And it was the most astonishing thing to see. So I want to keep on doing that. Good, good for you. So let me go back to your history a little bit again. Um, you came over to the United States 20 years ago, is it now? Uh, it's actually 2005, it was 2005. Okay, so getting close. So. And you speak flawless English, not, notwithstanding what you say, but you continue to write in German and then work with our good friend, your, your translator. Um, not any more or less. Ah. So now, as I work with Guillermo, I had to write in English or I couldn't communicate with of him. Of course. So I had done- He only speaks before. Spanish. If you could have written in Spanish. <laughs> Oh yeah, that would have been a disaster. So I, I wrote that for the first time, a, a full novel in English. And the reaction to it was so extraordinary, especially in Germany where it was translated. Interesting. Was kind of translation. Not by you. <laughs> so I was like, oh God, they're gonna kill this. You know, they gotta say, where's your voice? But as I had worked profoundly on the translation, it was an incredible success, both in England, America and, and, and in Germany. So now, I write half my books in English and half of them in German. Well, this is wonderful. And I mean, the, the, the truth is, I guess, in a world of fantasy, um, the language is the world's language. It's not a particular country's language. It's these, these things that are so frightening, so beautiful, yes. are universal, I, I guess. And I have to mention that, of course, you made me write English when I wrote the story for Sherlock, about Sherlock Holmes. You well, know? I didn't make you. You could have written it in German yeah. and then translated it, but... Uh, it was wonderful, because sometimes I am in love writing with English, in English, because it has a lightness to it that you have to fight hard to get into the German language. The German language can get far heavier very easily when it comes to big content, which in fantasy can be quite a problem. 
you know I, and there i actually do love the lightness of the english language so um you talked about how you switched over from being an illustrator to a writer do you think that would be different today i mean do you think the market has changed the the publishing world has changed or do you think that's still you know possibility for somebody i think there are of course these very exciting artists like Chantan you know, who's one of the greatest storytellers of our time. And he tells his stories mostly with image, but, and sometimes with word. I had lots of young illustrators from Hamburg here, from my old school, who are slowly finding out what can I do with my art? How much words do I need? Where can I transgress? And of course, many of them go into animation, you know, where, where image and story come together. Right. Um, I saw some of them going into three-dimensional art and telling the story without word, but I also saw illustrators making the step here on the farm to suddenly become writers of their own stories because they missed doing that. So I think the market is generally at the moment very difficult, thanks to COVID. I hear from publishers that all over the world, we as established authors are very much wanted, but all the ones who are coming all the young ones are discouraged in a way because they can't do promotion. They can't currently do yes. it, right? So right. for publishers, it's a very difficult situation. And over the last years, it has been difficult anyway for young authors because publishers are so hungry for the brand or the immediate success. There is no slow growing of authors as I still knew it in, in my youth. That doesn't happen much anymore. And now, of course, sadly, this virus has made it even more difficult. So you better be a genius to start with, or else you're not going to get anywhere. So it sounds like so. Fortunately, you were. Now you you've actually delved into some other medium media as well. Uh, Mirror World, for example, was a, a whole effort to do something on the computer. Yes. And so on. So you've never just been a writer uh, or, or just an illustrator. You you sort of merge all these things. I really love to do that. And I've seen here, you know, I just had a Javier Navarrete here who wrote the music for Pan's Labyrinth for the movie. And to suddenly have a brilliant musician here, what does that trigger in your mind as a storyteller? I really do believe by now in this collaboration of the arts and that it can do so much and is such an interesting field. Well, I, I want to talk um, a little bit about world building, but I think what I want to do is talk to Pat for a little bit about his approach to things. And then the three of us can talk about world building. And so you're gonna be thinking about that, about sort of how do you do this? Do you, do you sit down and make up rules and all that? Think hard about that. I'm gonna come back to you with that. <laughs> so Pat Rothfuss, um, a, a, a newbie, just a few books to your credit. And how did you get started, Pat? I, I know you were a fan for a long time and then there you were on the map. Well, uh, it's, uh, I, I remember at one point somebody said, you know, they were like overnight success, Patrick right. Rothfuss. And I was like, well, yeah, I worked, I worked for 14 years on this book so that I could be an overnight <laughs> success. Um, but uh, while I certainly was a reader of fantasy and I loved fantasy um, and my experience was, was very, a, a little similar to uh, Cornelia's, but but different because um, fantasy in the U.S. it is sort of uh, for a long time it was viewed as niche, or it was infantilized, or people yes. who read that sort of fiction. Uh, and now, of course, you know, geek is chic. But I like back back when I was young and reading these things, or playing role-playing games, um, you know, I was never beaten up, but people were beaten up for like being weird and reading fantasy. Um, so, uh, but that said, it was around and, you know, we, we were sort of like viewed as like, oh, you read those books, but at least those books were known and sort of accepted. Uh, but that, again, that was a long while ago. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we look at Stranger Things, for example, the wonderful TV show. I think that really sort of captures that, that feeling that this is a 10-year-old boy uh, endeavor. 
And, yeah. um, you know, there's a couple of girls, but they're not, they're not the D&D players and they're not quite into the genre stuff. I mean, I, I was one of those too. I was one of those kids who read fantasy as a young boy and felt like, you know, women weren't sort of part of that world generally. But you then said, okay, I can write this. I never did that. <laughs> well, you know, interestingly, I, and this is something not a lot of people know, um, like Cornelia said, I never, I never thought, oh, I'll be an author. Um, that was never a goal. Um, people would say to me, oh, you finally have, have fulfilled your dreams. I'm like, I never dreamed of being an author. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to write computer games. Um, except when I was a kid, computer games, there were no graphics yet. Like, right. I, that's not an exaggeration, everyone. No, no, I remember. <laughs> It was the old Infocom interactive fiction games. Adventure. And, and long Zork. before I ever wrote a fantasy novel um, or tried to even write my bad high school novel, I tried to write a text adventure game. And uh, except the only computer language I knew at that point was basic, which was never meant to actually write any real programs in. Right. Nevertheless, I wrote a several thousand line program that had inventory management and wow you know I, I couldn't write the text parser but everything else was there for the game wow i remember early in those days word perfect which is a word processing software that i still use because one of the last on earth to use it actually had a mac that, that you, a macro where you could write a text-based adventure game and it would sort of do the work for you. So uh, not to be engaged in one-upsmanship, Word <laughs> Perfect is, is some space egg technology uh, compared to Word Star, which ah, is yes. my preferred text uh, <laughs> processor, um, which I only grudgingly left behind when computers stopped having DOS on them. And then I grudgingly moved to Word 97, which is what I still use. Um, hey, you know, what, what, it works. But you, you enjoy working slowly, or you seem to work slowly. Slowly meaning, you know, these are, first of all, the books themselves are massive. I mean, they're just enormous. Um, so, of course, they don't come out, you know, twice a year. Um, but you're process is you want to talk a little bit about it sort of you know it's a long process to get a book out generally. yeah i mean in terms of that first book i mean 14 years yeah well i i, I will say when you when the speed at which your first book is published is based very little on your actual writing process right, right. um you know yes one year writing 13 years trying to find somebody who wants to publish it you know exactly that, that's not you but but that can happen now that said, I do think, um, you know, I never studied writing very formally. I took a few classes at the local college. I hung out with a few aspiring writers. And you mentioned that, uh, you know, that I was a fan. See, nowadays I know what that means. Like fans for 60 years have gone to conventions and you spread zines. Long before the internet, they were forming these almost like underground communities where they could share their love of, you know, Star Trek or, you know, right. these, these geeky niche things because they were geeky and niche and kind of looked down on. So they would find their people somehow, but I never knew about fandom. Um, I had a few friends who kind of read some of these similar books and it wasn't until I had actually sold my book that I learned that there were hundreds and thousands of conventions all over the world where people like me got together and shared their love of these geeky things. I, I, I tend to think of myself as a bit of a feral writer where I grew up in, the, in a small town in the North Woods of Wisconsin and I kind of figured out a lot of this on my own and as a result, I sort of learned it strange. Uh, I, I don't seem to f use a lot of the same terminology narratively um, or follow a lot of the same traditions that a lot of people who were more part of the culture and part of the traditional educational system about creative writing, they seem to do things a certain way. It also, 
I will say it's, this isn't necessarily to the good because it, it did take 14 years and I endlessly reinvented the wheel. Um, it would have been really nice to have somebody show me what a wheel was, save me a year and a half. Um, yes, well, well I, I know that there are fans out there of yours who are clamoring for book three of the Name of the Wind series, but you know, they'll wait. Uh, but you've been doing other things. You've been, first of all, you've been in, involved with other media. Um, you're doing some graphic novels. Um, are, are you involved with film at all? Um, you know, there, I have always wanted to be able to play wheresoever I will. Um, and I think one of the great joys of writing is that in some ways it's still the closest thing to an egalitarian art form that exists. Because if you want to be an actor, you better live in LA, you know? Right. right. Um, if you want to you know, be a painter, you have to afford paint and that's expensive. But if you want to be a writer, I mean, a computer helps, but computers are kind of ubiquitous. But even that isn't necessary, like a dollar for pencil and paper and you can be a writer. Right. And you can do it anywhere and you can live anywhere, you know, and then it gets published. It doesn't matter where you live. I mean, again, some things can help, but uh, so I started with writing, but again, first I wanted to be a computer game writer. And the ideas of like collaborative narrative or interactive fiction are still fascinating to me. Um, video games have gone down this long, strange road to where like now they are beautiful, but narratively they are largely, like at best they are empty and at worst, they are horribly culturally destructive um, because typically all of the money goes into beautiful graphics and rarely is the focus on meaningful, psychologically nutritive narrative. Sounds just like the film industry, doesn't it? It's like the screenwriters, yeah, they're sort of a necessary evil to put those <laughs> actors up there, but you know, it's people go for the CGI, they go for the actors, the sets, et cetera, so. And so similarly, I, you know, I have, uh, I, I've sort of made friends in the video game community. I've, uh, I foolishly once agreed to do a comic book. Somebody's like, ooh, could you write us a novella? And I'm like, oh no, no way, I, I can't write you a novella. Um, actually that was, uh, I agreed to write a part of a video game uh, for a person who had done some work in the past that I was very fond of. It was, uh, it was Colin who was lead story on the original Planescape Torment games. Oh, um, I love that. Oh, it was wonderful. Very narratively rich, genuine choice that the, the, the player could engage with that oh, legitimately shaped the story. Absolutely. Um, and so when he invited me into his new project, I'm like, oh boy, I can't say no. And I agreed to write a character in this world. And then afterwards he said, could you write a novella sort of introducing the world and the character? And I'm like, oh, people would be furious if I wrote a novella for you. <laughs> and so I said, you know what? I could do a comic though, way less words in a comic. That'll be easy. And that is where I stepped my first foot into comic art. And I did that with my friend, Nate Taylor, uh, because before he and I had done like The Princess and Mr. Whiffle, but that is a picture book. That is word text, word text. It's not comic art. Right. And the rules are different in that different medium. So we made, uh, I signed up to do a 20 page comic and within one day of work, I went back to them and I said, I think I need about 45 pages. Right. And they're like, okay, fine. Um, and I worked with him on it and did so much work than more work than I ever anticipated. But that's where I got my feet wet and I learned to love that, that entirely different medium, you know? Um, and, and I've been playing in it ever since. It's, it's a wonderful medium, but like books, it's a medium where you have a lot of control. 
I, I'm worried, and I, I wonder if you're worried about film adaptations of your books, which are <laughs> at least sort of, the, they're there, maybe. They're coming, we hope. Uh, are you frightened about those? Um, I've been frightened of a movie adaptation of my work since before I was published. Um, and I, you know, we sort of took a run at it a couple of times. Uh, eventually, and most recently, we've ended up at Lionsgate. And for the last four years, I've been working with them um, in collaboration with some really delightful people um, uh, because we wanted to do, um, I wanted to do television. Lionsgate was a little more interested in movies. And the more I learned, I mean, for me, it's like, I just want more time to tell better stories. Sure because my books are more character-centered than plot-centered, and TV is the better place for that. But um, eventually I pitched to Lionsgate, you know, why don't we do movies and a TV show in collaboration, and then maybe let's do a video game too. Let's do all the things. And so we have been working on that off and on. Um, John Rogers came in, who is a real masterful a uh, storyteller and a great showrunner and a dyed in the wool geek himself. Um, but of course the, 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 the jewel in, in the crown of that collaboration is uh, when I, I got to meet Lin-Manuel Miranda and found out that we, we loved each other's work and he loved the thought of coming in and helping with music. And, and so like, that was really what sealed the deal for me is the opportunity to work with Lynn because I was so afraid of this deal. It took us 18 months merely to negotiate the contract. Um, Interesting that he's involved. I, I thought he was wonderful in his dark materials. And uh, uh, I, I assume that he had some more than just acting involvement in it because it seems to be his sort of metier. Lynn, Lynn is a masterful performer, creator, but again, I will, I will pin on him uh, storyteller. You know, he, he didn't just do some of the songs for Moana. He was involved in the creation of that story. Right. And, you know, how much? Well, it's a collaboration. But I think it, it speaks well of him that Moana, you know, Moana is beautiful. And, and it, Moana makes me cry in the way that a Disney movie has not in ages. Well, let's, um, Cornelia, if you're there, let's, let's bring you back into the conversation. Well, I want to talk a little bit about um, your work ethic, your, your approach to things, your, your, your process, because both of you, in very similar ways, I have to say, are world builders. And in fact, Pat, let me, don't forget to mention world builders, because I, want, I wanted to ask you at some point, too, about your, your charitable organization, World Builders, and what you're trying to do there. But you are both world builders in, in that sense. You built uh, uh, the mirror world, Cornelia, the Inkheart world, which is not the same. It's the same. Uh, it is? You think it is? You see it all as Earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you do this? First of all, do you, do you sit down and you write out rules for yourself and do all the structuring first? Or does it, no, is it organic? You know, when, I, when I now hear that, you know, Pat took his time, you know, and properly did this. Oh, I'm so bad at this because I'm so impatient. I just stumble through the wardrobe or the mirror or whatever I find. I just run through it and there I am. I have no idea what I'm in. <laughs> I'm riding while I'm going. I lose my way all the time because I'm in a labyrinth, right? Of course, the yes. The tricks me badly, chases me into hedges puts the wrong golden trinket on the path, tricks me with very seductive characters who lead me to the wrong place. I just had it, I'm working on the fourth draft of Reckless Four and my God, one of the characters tricked me so badly that ah. I'm chopping away at the chapters and redoing everything. So sadly, I don't have a very organized approach. I do research on the world like, oh, this is a medieval world, so let me learn about the Middle Ages. Or, Oh, this is set in Italy. Let me have a look at what this would look like. So that's about my research. Well, you have to, you know, as far as those characters, Jana Devanovich said, somebody asked her about, you know, what happens when your characters decides to go in a direction you didn't want. 
She said, I shoot him in the back. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, no, sadly, I'm, I have another approach. I'm like, oh, God, he knows far better where to go than I do. So I run after my character. You know? Um, I remember hearing, uh, Tol or not Tolkien, uh, Mark Twain wrote a funny little story about a, uh, a story about a story he was writing. And he goes, it wasn't going where I wanted. And this character was so problematic. So I took them out behind the barn and they drowned in a well. <laughs> and he goes, and then the story was so much easier. I, I took another character and I put them in the well too. And eventually I killed off all, I put all the characters, I drowned them in this well. And finally I could have control of my own story. Um, I might be misremembering part of that anecdote. Uh, I, once, I, I cut out characters I, who try to take over. I, I have done that before. Then I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. You're not running with this story. I just take you out. You're going to have another story. I've done that. But uh, otherwise, no, sadly, they just so no, the story. no the structuring, story. no building the rules ahead of time. I'm no, not talking about no, outlining necessarily. No, but at no least... rules. I find out about the rules where I'm going. And... Um, but what I do is I prepare like main characters. What could this be about? Uh, uh, mainly the place. The place is for me always the, the main hero. Yes. And then I have them enter and then I plan about 10 chapters. But I always say that the, the greatest example was like um, when I wrote Ink Spell and I wrote the first chapter and I knew Dustfinger and Farid are there and they're meeting Orpheus. And I thought he's skinny and looks Sicilian, like black haired and but and up comes a fat blonde man walks down the hill and introduces him to himself to me. Like, okay, I'm Orpheus. And I'm like, oh my God, it's a <laughs> chapter. So yeah, so that's my process. Yeah. Pat, is it similar for you or not? More similar than not. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people who hear, ooh, you know, Rafis, you know, worked for 14 years. 14 he, years, right. <laughs> he must be so deliberate and methodical. And I'm like, oh no, you've, you have created your own story there. <laughs> what it was is, you know, I, I, I was constantly making terrible choices. Um, and, um, and also I was not a professional writer. I was writing as a, as a hobbyist effectively. And so I would write intensely for, you know, a couple of months or maybe at times a couple of years and then something would go wrong in my life or I would go to grad school, which is kind of the same thing. Grad school, Or, or have children or little yeah. distractions like that, you know? And if it's your hobby, of course, you just lay it down and then you miss it and you pick it back up. But the big thing was, uh, you know, part of the reason it wasn't published is that I tried and it wasn't good enough. And whenever that happened, I took the book back and I'm like, what is going on here? What's wrong? And then I would renovate the book again. So I, I think the, um, back to world, I, I will say, part of that has ingrained myself in the process. I think it might be fair to say that I revise maybe as much as any living author. Um, Cause Name of the Wind did go through, depending on how you count it, like between three and 800 drafts. <laughs> um, but then even when I was published and theoretically I knew what I was doing, I took Wise Man's Fear through at least two or 400 drafts where I would read it and read it and work on the language because I care a lot about the language. Yes. And, um, but in terms of world building, um, I am wildly erratic um, where I will have an idea for the world. Like right now I'm puttering around with Modeg in my world. I'm telling a story in Modeg which is a very different culture, a very different ecology, a very, just yes. everything is different than um, like the, the remnants of the Aeturan Empire where, is, where Quoth's main story happens. Um, and Modeg is kind of insular and Modeg has its own language and it's still an intact culture because it wasn't overrun by Aetur way back in the day. And so I'm, I'm building this, world and it's the story of 
it's the story of this mythic hero. It's sort of her origin. And so what I want to do is tell her story. She's the important person. She goes out, she meets interesting people, things happen, but she also explores this little piece of the world. And in going through the draft again, the first town she comes to, the first new town she's ever seen, I'm like, I, I did this too fast. Also, how can a town really be self-sufficient? And then I start to go crazy. Um, and then I say, can you have a town of a thousand people that's relatively self-sufficient without trade? Can you, do, like, how many people need to be farmers? Also, if there is an industry in town, can it be pottery? Where does clay come from? Is there a clay pit? Hold on, what if the clay pit runs out? Uh, oh, it uh, turns uh, out you can make clay. Also, there's a tannery. Ooh, you got to do a lot to leather to make it. And so I, I actually sent a friend a message the other day and I said, today I learned how to tan leather, a lot about mercury poisoning, um, where, how to make clay. And I listed like eight other things and I'm like, all in all, it was a good day of writing. <laughs> um, but I don't think that counts as world building in, in a traditional sense. It's not like, I, I made rules and whatever, because now what happens, Laniel comes in and she, what, what this is added to this chapter is maybe 150 words. And most of it I leave out. I understand. It's the iceberg. Um, well, this is, this is what I've said to my friends, writers many times, is that I feel so bad for you guys. I do tons of research and never throw away a single word. You have to throw away 98% of what you do. You know, I put all of mine in footnotes. Maybe if you had footnotes in your editions. Uh, we'll eventually do a heavily a, footnoted Name of the Wind. Yes. I have a question for, for Pat. Do you also have the feeling that you do not really build that world or discover it? You only discover it, but it's there. Oh, absolutely. Right? Exactly. Absolutely. But we are not creators. I, 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 I vacillate wildly back and forth where mm -hmm. sometimes on a very good day, I am like, yes, you know, <laughs> I, before me, there was nothing. And I have wrought two pages of novel. And interestingly, to back up your, we are merely, or what is it? Uh, sculptors say, well, how did, how do you sculpt an elephant? It's like, well, you take a block of stone and you take away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. And similarly, I think as an, as an author, sometimes I feel like I'm merely describing. That's what I always feel like. But and I always feel like I didn't open my eyes properly. I ran past it too fast. I didn't look properly. I made it too easy for myself. For me, and, and I do go back and I make intentional decisions and I try to fix problems and I'll move things around. But what's really fascinating to me is because I do so many revisions. Um, at one point, um, I had printed out a new manuscript and then I, I read through it and I red penned it up and I moved things and I changed things. And then I realized that I had a newer version of the file and so i took my this one and then i looked and everything that i had marked on this was already <laughs> like 80 percent of it was in this new thing where i'm like this sort of implies either i am way more together mentally than i know is true <laughs> or what i'm doing is i'm effectively chipping away everything that doesn't look like the name of the wind from this block of stone. Um, yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about um, fantasy in general. And I mean, I think to me, it's very interesting to see how it went from a uh, niche to, you know, look at Game of Thrones. I mean, the most popular television show in the world, maybe. Um, and of course, every major studio now says, we want one of those. Um, what happened? 
was it the world got so crappy that everybody needed fantasy or well, I always think that it, that has nothing to do actually with it because I think the more crappy the world gets, the more you express that in fantasy. Because I think there is no better mirror for the world than fantasy. You, you know, certainly, we, certainly the world of Westeros is not exactly an idyllic place. No. It, it's like, for, I think people don't recognize you're showing them exactly what the world is about because you just put another costume on. But, but actually, Fantasy is the sharpest scalpel you can put on reality. And then they, like, that was, you know, that's what, for example, I, I, I realized when I worked on uh, Pat's Labyrinth, you know, my God, what masterful, realistic storytelling in the truest sense, because reality is fantastic. And if you forget about that, I always do that when journalists say to me, I'm sure, Pat, you hear that question all the time. So why do you write fantasy? Uh. So um, I always say this, okay. Can you define reality right now? Okay, we're sitting on a ball, racing around a fireball, right? Can we agree on that? That's reality. <laughs> then they already start looking at you like, what? And then you'll say, you see that fly on the table has a far different time sense than you are. It sees us at the moment in slow motion. Is that reality? You can define it that way. And then they slowly get very, you know, you see them like in their faces, like they really don't think about the world that way. And you're like, the molecules and the table you are sitting at, reality. So I, in fantasy, try to get close to the craziness of our reality. If, if you say, no, I just want to focus on human reality right now. I don't want to see anything else. I don't want a historical perspective. I want nothing. Then you talk about the so-called realism. Yeah. I, it, it, you're, you're right. I, I used to, not so much anymore, but the one that always f floored me was, um, it, it was such a weird backhanded compliment. You're such a good writer, comma, <laughs> why do you write <laughs> fantasy? You're so good, you've overcome the limitations of being a fantasy writer. And so I, I would have two answers typically. And well, I would have a bunch of answers that I would never say out loud because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the first one is, is the simplest and the truest, which is to say, I think if you're writing a story, you're answering one of two questions. And the question is either, what is or what if? Oh. And of all of those questions, what if is the more interesting one to me? Interesting. Uh, because, because you cannot talk about what if without talking about what is. And of all the genres, no genre is better equipped to deal with what if than fantasy. So that's a, a simple one. But, uh, but also the bigger answer is, and, and to sort of address like, ooh, fantasy is big now. Actually, no, like fantasy was never not big. I agree. Every meaningful story that you've ever run into in literature or history, it's like Gilgamesh, um, you know, and Nana, queen of heaven and earth, the entirety of the Bible, every good Shakespeare play, you know, Hamlet has a ghost, you know, don't, don't say that's literature and it's not fantasy. There's literally a ghost. There's witches in Macbeth. Midsummer sure. Night's Dream is full of fairies and magic. Fantasy was never not here. It was never not good. Those are always the best stories and humanity has always loved them. And anyone who doesn't see that is just playing a weird game of favorites and fake rules. Yeah. I think of it as, as um, almost like a, a placebo. That's not the right word, sugarcoat. It's, it's, we can talk to you about the serious things that go on in all those literary works. Um, and you'll actually pay attention if we call it fantasy. 
And you know, there's always that wonderful quote from Tolkien, which I, I'm sure I don't do it right now, that said, uh, okay, you call this escape. Who is against escape but the prison ward? Oh. And I always thought that is exactly, if you don't free your imagination of what is, and you don't ask what if, you are a proper citizen who doesn't question anything, won't change anything. And so the escape is a necessary act. I, and I remember there was a, a convention called Fantasy Matters. And, um, and some people invited me and they're like, you're our third guest we've invited. Um, but hopefully when you see the first two, you won't be offended. And it was Jack Zipes, um, one of the only academics that I feel I should not slander all of academia. Let's just say that I very much like Jack Zipes. He works in fairy tales. Um, and the other one was Neil Gaiman. And I'm like, I'll take third billing to Neil Gaiman and Jack Zipes. And Gaiman came out there and he gave a talk. And that was the first time I'd met him in person and saw what a genuinely kind and delightful person he was. And he talked about how the Chinese government um, was trying to figure out how, you know, they're like, our, our workers are so good at so many things. Our technology sector is great at so many things, but we aren't innovating. We don't make, like, if, if you look at Google, you look at Pixar, you look at like these Apple, like what are these, these big things that make things and suddenly from nothing, they're amazing. And then they look in all these organizations that continuously innovate. And they found that the workers who work there, the one thing they all have in common is that they read and love fantastic literature, speculative literature. And so suddenly the Chinese government, which had previously been like, no silly bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, like all that fantasy, why would you even know? And in a place like China, like an authoritarian regime, you don't do that if you, and so they tried to sort of like ease up on that, but the entire culture was, had sort of had that pressed out of them. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Cornelia. The, you know, the, the ability to, to wonder, you know, it, in, in my opinion, that is um, one of the, the, the best uses of fantasy in the original primal meaning of the word is to make people wonder, like to say, what if, and also to feel wonder, to feel wonderful. Now, also, I think fantasy also teaches them to be shapeshifters. Yes. You know, to, to leave behind what their identity, their so-called identity is, and to also realize they may be the other, or the other may be more familiar than they think. All these abilities come from fantasy. That's why, of course, dictatorships fear it very much. It's, it's very explosive to fly with your imagination because you escape them suddenly so easily. So I'm pleased to hear that the Chinese realized it may be necessary to get creative again. Because and suddenly we are seeing some great science fiction coming out of China. Yeah. So finally. Uh, do you want to say a few words about world builders and, and yeah, what you're trying to do there? Them. Sure. I, you know, it was, it was easier for me to focus on my writing back when I was a useless idiot, part-time, mostly uh, failure of a student. Uh, um, and because like, I didn't have much else to do with my time. And then I got very lucky. Um, I, my books came out to good success and people started to like them. And I started to write on my blog. And at one point I said, hey, it, it had been a year. And I said, hey everyone, let's try a fun thing. If you buy a copy of the new version of the book and you take a picture of yourself with it, doing something fun, we'll have a little contest and like the best people will get a signed book or something. I don't know. Just goofing around on my blog. And like, 
I got thousands of pictures. And I had no idea that this many people were listening. And they en engaged with such amazing enthusiasm and joy and excitement. And they did these fantastical photo and costumes and, and everything. And it was such a delight. Um, but, and then my first thought was like, cool, what do we do next? And then I went, wait, wait, wait. Um, maybe I could do something other than roll around in my own ego. And so I threw out to my community, I'm like, hey, Heifer International is my favorite charity. They focus on education and food sustainability um, all over the world, helping people feed themselves. Um, this is for the first time I've ever had grown up money in my life. If you guys want to donate here, I'll match your donations up to $5,000. And I'm like, nobody's going to go for this, but let's throw it at the wall. And I said, I'll match donations for a month. And within like three days, we'd raise $5,000. And I was like, those are just the people who show up every day and they're really excited. I go, we'll raise it to 10, but whatever, hit 10, hit. And I'm like, uh but I said I would match donations for a month. And, uh, and so I did, and I used up all of my money. Um, all of the money that I had made uh, on, uh, in the year of being published as a new author, I, I, I did not know that as an author, they don't take taxes out of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I hadn't set any aside. <laughs> and so, um, Altogether, we raised like more than a hundred thousand dollars, just me like writing blogs, and I'm like, I'll give away some posters, but also other authors are like, hey, you're doing a cool thing. Can I donate a signed book? And so I'd met some authors at that point. They sent some signed books, and that was the first year of World Builders. Um, World Builders just finished its eleventh annual end of year fundraiser. And uh, to date, we've raised more than $10 million for Heifer International oh. and more than $14 million total for various charities, including like helping the Syrian refugees or wow. hurricane disaster relief. Um, we also support, uh, we just did one for a charity called Project Hope. Yeah. Um, who for 60 years has provided emergency medical relief um, when there is a catastrophe somewhere in the world. And so right now, everywhere is a medical catastrophe. And so Project Hope is like, don't worry, we know what to do and how to help. But they're a 60-year-old charity. They don't know how to do online fundraising. So I we're like, hey, guess, guess what we're good at? So um, that's what World Builders does. And these days I focus a lot of my energy on, on them. Um, I'm, uh, we, we went through kind of a rough patch because I didn't know how to make a, a business or a charity. And so we had a bit of a, some growing pains in a transition, but now we've expanded the board and we have better infrastructure. Um, I bought a facility and we do merchandise and, uh, ooh, I, I, I'll, I'll only share one more thing. Um, but um, with the, the rise of the pandemic, we, uh, again, our focus has always been on sustainable good in the world. <laughs> um, and for most instances, Heifer International is great because if you teach someone how to be a better farmer, their life is better forever. Yes. Um, but also, sometimes you do need disaster relief, which is why we work with Mercy Corps and, and places like that. But suddenly the entire world is in a situation where disaster relief is an issue, as well as many of the people that we work with in the creative community are really struggling, like they make their living at conventions. Um, or they're performers, or they're, um, they're living in the gig economy, 
and suddenly all conventions are gone, all Renaissance festivals are gone, publishers are not picking up new authors as quickly and easily. Um, but what we did is I found a seamstress who normally goes to Renaissance fairs, um, who I knew through a friend, and she had already converted her workshop just to make masks for people. And she'd had to let a lot of her people go because there's no money in just giving away masks to the community. But World Builders reached out to her and said, she also used to be like a naval medical officer. Oh this person God. has had a wonderful life. And so she's making well-designed, medically sensible, beautiful masks. Oh um, and so I reached out and I said, could you please bring all of your people back and make us as many masks as quickly as you can? And then we sell them in our online store, but more importantly, we give them away. Um, so you can show up to the World Builders store and just say, I need a mask and you won't be charged for it. Or if you wanna buy a mask, that's great because, and you're supporting somebody who otherwise would not have a job because they've lost their job due to the pandemic, or you can buy a mask and donate a mask to somebody who just needs one. And it's, it's such a good feeling. I love bringing people together and everyone wins. That's like, what World is, Builders about is, is I wanna make systems so that everyone wins and the entire world slowly improves. I, this I is to me- impressed. I, this is, but this is Cornelia. You're just as impressive in in no, slightly no, no, no. different that's, fields. That's uh, another level. Less. You're well, a whole he thing of books. He can uh, build uh, magical wardrobes. <laughs> you know, he's like, I have never met somebody who can do it. He's building them. This is not a surprise, though. The the the, the world of fantasy writers is is a community that cares very much about the real world. Uh, that's that's my experience. Yes, yes I am. and. Uh, Cornelia, when I was hearing about you know, where you're like, oh, I bring creatives out and I have this place and they can stay. And I'm like, oh, I've thought about doing that. Like, <laughs> like I, I can wholly recommend it. It's the best thing I ever did in my life. I, uh, it's, it's been one of my dreams is to like have a place to support new writers. And actually another thing World Builders is doing is because everyone's book tours have been canceled. So we're uh, reaching out to established writers. Like uh, we just did one with Martha Wells, who was about to have her first ever book tour and it was canceled. And I'm like, come to us. We'll do online book signings. Oh, wow. And we made her a beautiful book plate with new art made just for her book. She signed it. And so all of her readers get a signed book. Wow. She gets kind of a book tour. Right and people get to support a charity and everyone wins but also we're going to start doing this for new authors um to help them because it's such a bad time to try to launch yes. your okay. imagine yeah. finally getting published yes exactly. and like how do you promote your book nobody can leave the house um That's right so and we're, and we're all too. inundated with things on the internet so yeah. how do you how do you get traction this yeah. is, um, I mean, we're, we're not focusing here in this series on, on starting authors, but clearly one of the things I've tried to talk about consistently is about new writers and about how, how they can succeed in this environment. We're gonna end up with, uh, we're gonna have links to world builders. Uh, we, I also wanna, we, we're, sort of, we're basically out of time, but I, I want you to be able to put up on, on the website when we do bios of each of you, whatever you want about new projects that you're working on, things that you want to pitch. Cornelia, you have a book about to come out soon. Uh, Pat, your fans are saying from your lips less to God's ears, you should have a book out soon. I, uh, uh, well, I, I don't have a new book out in English soon. It's coming out in Germany. But what I did now because of the virus, I published 14 chapters of a book I haven't finished yet as a thank you to my readers, Aww. as audio readings. So every second week, they read one chapter of the new ink card book. And that... I haven't finished the book yet, so I said to them, it can be that those chapters change. 
<laughs> but people want to hear them now. So it's the oral tradition. It's the oral tradition. You hear the story, it may be different the next time you're at the fireplace. I have no idea when I will finish that book. So, Pat, if you ever feel like that, give them one or two chapters and then say, they may change. You know, I, I have been thinking about it, especially because so much of what I do, I'm like, maybe I'll, uh, I'll sort of offer this up as a way to draw some attention to one of our fundraisers. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, but, that, 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 because I asked my readers, you know, what do you want me to do now in these times? And they all wanted to know either of the future of certain characters, where right. are they now, you know, or they wanted to know what, uh, yeah, of future worlds. So I had 14 chapters. So I thought, oh, bam, why don't you do it? You know, I could feed a friend of mine who's an actor and all his performances canceled. Exactly. Oh, yeah. that. So, you know, so we recorded him in the sound studio of a friend and, and that, that kind of, you know. Great. Yeah. Well, we, we, uh, we sadly must bring this to a close. As I said, we could go for another couple hours. But, <laughs> um, yes. So I very much appreciate both of you participating in this, taking time out of your, what appear to be very busy days uh, for both of you. 